different categories of persons, I gather. You have some who are, for example, going through the uh, CBP-1 process who are looking to uh, apply for asylum. There are others who are just brazenly crossing the border without regard for that process. Talk to us about what that looks like and, and, and these different categories of individuals. So let's do a little compare and contrast. Uh, what does a typical day look like in New York City uh, with regard to the mig migration process? And it is completely different than what we are dealing with every single day on the border. We have in, in any one particular location thousands of people crossing the border in, in a mad rush type of way. You have people who are dropped off on buses at city centers and may be connected to uh, non-governmental organizations, things like that. We have people who uh, are, are being pushed across the border by the cartels, by the thousands, into small little communities, com completely disrupted. One thing that happens is once they get uh, across the border, we have one thing that does not take place in New York. They're called bailouts. The people who get across the border, there are smugglers on the Texas side of the border uh, who pick them up, put them in cars, and then are, are driving uh, at a racing speed to get to the next location in, in the delivery process. And we have Texas Department of Public Safety officers that are pursuing them and uh, at, at a dangerous speed, you know, 80, 90, 100 miles per hour car chases. Uh, and the smugglers know if we capture the smugglers, they're going to be arrested and put behind bars for 10 years or longer. And so they bail out and they, the smugglers take off running and leave behind a car full of migrants who they're smuggling. You don't have bailouts here in New York that I know of. Uh, and you see them in, uh, many, hardly in any other place. So we have uh, the, the bailouts. Uh, we have crime taking place in ways that you don't see in New York. We, we have cartels that have been caught on video uh, as they're coming across the border. Uh, they have uh, assault rifles, uh, AK-47s, uh, extraordinary weapons that they're using. And, and they have high-powered capabilities of killing people, protecting themselves. Uh, it's a uh, quasi-war zone down there. And speaking of the war zone, again, we as a state are, are trying to instill the rule of law as much as we possibly can, only to be at war, not so much with those who are coming in, but at war with our own federal government that is interfering with Texas's attempt to enforce the rule of law in our state. But the, the volumes are so high, and I think you, you may have touched upon this a little bit, an area that you hear a whole lot about on TV or whatever uh, is a town called Eagle Pass. And you said Eagle Pass, uh, 25,000, I think it's actually 28,000, cl close to rounding air for 25,000. But in one week, one week, this town of 28,000 people had more than 10,000 people coming into the town. It's unsustainable. They don't have the ability to take care of the people who are coming across the border. They don't have any you know, hotels or any other type of location where they can house people. And that's exactly why we had to engage in the busing operation to provide a sense of relief uh, to these towns that were completely overwhelmed uh, by the number of migrants who were coming in and being dropped off by Border Patrol in their communities. I wonder, uh, what would a more cooperative and effective partnership between uh, Texas and the federal government look like? What are the things that you would want to see, say, in a future presidential administration, or if this administration decided to make a sharp course correction? Yeah. So this is not a theoretical question. This is a question that we've actually lived, because this is exactly what we did under the Trump administration. And, and that is, uh, under the Trump administration, we didn't have to go through all of these scenarios and jump through these hoops that we're jumping through now. Uh, when, when the Trump administration was in office, they applied the law that exists already in the United States, uh, and uh, they ended the catch and release, and they enforced it. If, if someone came across the border and they were caught, they were going to be repatriated or sent back 
to the country from which they came. So at that time, the state of Texas was involved, but in a much less, lesser way, where at that time, we would be involved in the apprehension game, and anybody that we apprehended, we would turn over to the Border Patrol, and at that time, the Border Patrol would be involved in the process of sending people back to the country from which they came. Now, under the Biden administration, uh, if we apprehend somebody and turn them over to the Border Patrol, the Border Patrol is going to give them a, a notice to appear, which is known as a notice to disappear. And if they get a notice to appear, it means they have to show up for their asylum hearing, some of which are put off for three or four years. And something like 90% of the people who get these notices to appear never show up. And they disappear in the United States of America. So it is extraordinarily easy for a state, Texas or some other state, to collaborate with the Border Patrol, with uh, the federal administration, when the federal administration is enforcing the rule of law. When they are abandoning the rule of law, we cannot cooperate with them. When we will not be an accomplice to that. Instead, we have to alter our strategies so that we, the state of Texas, are using every tool that we can to enforce the rule of law in Texas and in the United States. There have been many claims made about Operation Lone Star and specifically the busing operations that have helped relieve some of that pressure on border communities in Texas. One of the arguments you hear from public officials uh, here in New York State, Chicago, Philadelphia, and other cities uh, is that essentially this is something that has been chaotic, where there has not been uh, meaningful coordination between public officials in Texas and in these various jurisdictions. I wonder if you could talk to us a bit about the initial rationale and also about how you have endeavored to ensure uh, that these uh, transports are safe and orderly. Sure. So first of all, we need to understand what is truly chaotic. Again, what's going on in New York, I know is, is not maybe the, the common circumstance or, or what you were looking for, but what is going on in New York is calm and organized compared to the real chaos of what we see on the border, not every day, but every hour of every day. We don't get any notice about who's coming across when or where or how many. And we don't have the Biden administration saying, oh, okay, we, we're going to have 5,000 people come into El Paso or Eagle Pass today or whatever the case may be. It's total chaos of what we're dealing with in Texas. But going back, the, the, the rationale for the busing began when I was talking to local officials, whether it be in Eagle Pass or Del Rio or other small communities on the border. And they were saying that the, the high volume number of migrants being dropped off by the Biden administration was unsustainable. They had zero ability to deal with it, as opposed to them being uh, cities of the population of 8 million people. They were communities of sometimes 8,000 or 18,000 people. And they, they, they themselves were saying, listen, we're, we're going to have to find some relief valve here uh, and move people to some other city by buses. And we said, well, we, we as a state will take over that operation. And thus began the busing process. And the busing process, FYI, is totally voluntary. No one has ever put on a bus against their will. No one has ever put on a bus without them identifying the location they want to go to. I was told about a story where Mayor Adams uh, had a team go down uh, to the border to observe what was going on, thinking that this is something that Texas was just making up and coercing people to do something. And uh, they, they visited a location uh, inside uh, about the size of this room uh, that was filled with migrants. Uh, and they went in there, and, and the people who were there uh, was asked, raise your hand if you want to go to New York. Like everyone raised their hand. <laughs> they about passed out. Uh, that's when they knew that the magnitude of the challenge that they were going to be facing. And so uh, the, the, the purpose of this is we don't have the ability in Texas to accommodate millions of people who are coming across the border. Uh, this is something where we have to re relieve our own communities from the challenges they face. Uh, and so uh, it's New York and other places uh, that are dealing with this. However, Maybe the most important thing I can tell you is this fact, this extraordinarily unknown. 
So uh, you have in New York, I mean, you may know the number, how many, how many migrants do you have here? 120,000, something like that? Say it again. In the shelter system, that's 61,000 in the shelter system, but overall. Uh... So let's say 120. So, so know this fact. Texas has bussed 15,800 to New York. Where do these other people come from? The Biden administration. The, the lead importer of migrants to New York is not Texas. It's Joe Biden. Joe Biden is doing it not just to New York, but to other communities across the entire country. We've sent about 10% of the migrants that you have here, which candidly would be easy for New York to deal with. What you're dealing with is Joe Biden either busing people or more likely flying people. You all saw the, the videos of months ago when they were flying them into Westchester and other places in the darkness of night when no one knew what was going on. And that process continues, maybe accelerating for all I know. And so this busing operation we have in Texas is minuscule compared to the high volume that you are getting from the Biden administration. I have a two-part question for you. So part of what you're telling us is that in a way, every state and local government that is dealing with this surge, that's dealing with this crisis, has a shared interest in ensuring that the federal government is doing its job when it comes to border enforcement. You also referenced in your remarks the fact that when you're seeing many public officials here in New York City and a number of other states, what they're saying they want their big ask from the federal government is temporary protected status. They are asking uh, the federal government to step in, uh, the executive branch to step in and unilaterally say, we are going to grant work authorization to folks who have entered the country unlawfully uh, through some other status. Uh, and uh, I wonder, you know, first to hear your reaction to that strategy, uh, having thought about it quite deeply and having done quite a bit on the subject, but then secondarily, um, you know, given that this is now a reality, given that you now have TPS for uh, you know, something along the lines of 500, 600,000 Venezuelans. What does that mean for Texas uh, in terms of uh, how you're able to handle this population, how you're able to um, you know, ensure that it's not causing the strain on your public services? I'll try to answer all the components of that question. Uh, there probably could not be a worse strategy, a worse policy than temporary protected status. Temporary protected status leads to permanent magnet status that would be attracting millions of more people to come to this country illegally. And along this line, let me make this point. I know that New York, historically, has been a place that you've been the home of legal migration to New York and to the country. So has Texas. Texas has been an area where there's been a lot of natural legal migration. There are millions of people trying to legally migrate to this country, do it the right way, and can add extraordinary value to our country. The people who are trying to legally migrate here are being pushed to the back of the line by the millions of people who are rushing in front of the line, destroying the legal immigration process. So it, it would be the worst policy to provide a, another magnet to attract even more people here. Your, your first part of your question, I think, was something about the would just uh, the shared I, I, So I gather, and you've explained it, you've knocked it out of the park. You explained why you believe that TPS is a bad idea, why extending it is a, is a bad idea. But also there are TPS beneficiaries in your state, and I wonder how you think about that angle of things. The argument you're hearing from the mayor and governor of New York is that, hey, we want these folks to work. We do not want them to be dependent. We do not want them to be in the shelter system. Uh, and so, you know, one wonders if, uh, you know, for you, 
as governor, um, is it useful to have a situation where folks who would otherwise... If you're just now tuning into Live Now from Fox, Texas Governor Greg Abbott out there live in New York City at the Manhattan Institute. Um, earlier he gave a speech about the migrant crisis right now. He's answering uh, this panel question. And then also um, he referred to the migrant crisis in New York City and what we saw this weekend out in Eagle Pass, Texas. We saw people swimming in the water. We saw people bathing in the water. Um, so that's what that second box is showing on your screen.